Great, so we're very lucky here today to have this uh, fantastic panel. I mean, just hundreds of credits and uh, film history sitting here. We're gonna try to uh, circumscribe a little bit what we're gonna talk about, but we're, we're talking about a very broad topic, which is color, and color science, and color art, and color psychology. And uh, we've got a, a, a lot to get to. I'll try to uh, direct it as well as I can, but the, you know, the objective for me is to speak as little as possible. I'm going to introduce you to these people, but uh, I'm pretty sure you know most of them. But uh, first of all, you know, tell me how many of you here are working filmmakers? Raise your hand, please. Quite a few. Oh, great. <laughs> and how many are students? Okay. <laughs> great. Okay, so uh, at my far right, Matt Tomlinson, color scientist for Harvard. Uh, Elodie Ishtar, <laughs> Ben, 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 Bradford Young, I think you know who he is, yeah. <laughs> Joe Gawler, a founder of, uh, uh, of, of Harbor and uh, a master colorist. And perhaps you know this fellow here. Stand, uh, you must stand, yeah, you, yeah, must stand. Yeah, yeah. you must stand, the you mayor must stand, of you must stand. So, you know, just to give us a little bit of context, uh, I mean, uh, I, w I wanted to talk about, you know, the, the evolution of, uh, of the color science. And, in, you know, in the old days, Ed can attest, you know, that when it was a film, the relationship between the cinematographer and the color timer was kind of sacrosanct. And uh, often the director was not even allowed in the room. Is that right, Ed? You know? We tried to. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, you had a, a position of trust, and uh, uh, you weren't ready to show the pictures uh, to your other collaborators until you and the color timer were ready. And that, of course, has evolved uh, with the, the evolution of digital technology. And I think in the beginning, uh, when the DI first came in, and there was this tremendous amount of control over the image after the fact, uh, it, uh, it, it, it struck fear into the hearts of cinematographers. You still needed to have the trust and uh, uh, the amazing control that you had over the image. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, it took a little bit of working out to make that, that relationship work. And I think that Harbor is uh, built around the idea of that trust, uh, so that from the beginning of the, uh, of the process, uh, from the conception of the images and, and the design of the images, through uh, the, the, the cinematography on the set and through post, could be more of a unified uh, procedure and uh, system. And uh, we're going we're gonna to get to that, uh, but I think first, you know, we should talk from the, the, the role of the, uh, the conception of the images and talk about color. I know that Ed wanted to talk a little bit about the, the psychology of perception, uh, the, what color is, what it means, and how cinematographers communicate with it. Now, I know that Ed, you know, some cinematographers say that, uh, uh, that, the, that the color can be a symbolic uh, uh, um, and, and a solid, uh, repeatable, uh, evocation of emotion in the viewer. But you were talking earlier to me about a, a, a different way of thinking about it. Well, tell the people what you were telling me earlier, Ed. Oh, tell the people. Well, mm. oh, you got me in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was saying that, it, look, image or color is not empirical. You know, that, that goes back to like 1810 when uh, Goethe wrote about color and the theory of color to uh, Joseph Albers writing about it in the 60s, um, interpretation of color. So, so, you know, I've heard people talk about, you know, the moon is mother and the sun is father, and well, that's fine if, if they think that, but that isn't necessarily even the way they thought about color in painting. They thought about it as how do people perceive certain colors, and it wasn't an empirical or uh, it was more a theoretical approach, which got a lot of, you know, at that time they were looking at color through wavelengths and, and trying to understand what color meant because of the wavelength of the uh, light. And what, what was so revolutionary about Goethe is that he said, you can't make that uh, distinction, but what you can do is observe color and see how it affects people's emotions. 
So that's why I've always tried to think about color, is how color can affect people's emotions. And, you know, just on a basic level, like warm colors advance and cool colors recede, and they have different effects against each other. And what Joseph Albers talked about was how color can change just by the representation of one color next to another, which even happens to you when you have, let's say, a green scene, and the next scene you have is a, a neutral scene. That, that neutral scene will actually look magenta because you're, you have a retina, you have a, a color in your mind that, that you know, re responds to the white light and you see it in its opposite. So those are all things we could talk about, but I'm more interested in what you said about the difference with film and digital, how you work with a director, which I'm sure most <coughs> of you deal with, is there was a, 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 um, a delay. You know, you would look at the, um, the print or the, you know, the film with the work print with, with the director and the colorist, and then you would give them notes, and then it would be a, like a day delay till they made a print, a new print, so you could discuss the color again. Well, now it becomes more problematic and difficult if you have the director immediately in the room to make the change. So you have no chance to respond to what you're doing. And I, I you know, that's something I think we could all talk about. Is it more difficult, the process of coloring a film um, because everyone feels that they have that immediate reaction to what they're looking at. And not everybody sees color or exposure the same way. If I could just add. Jump in, Joe, yeah. Is this, uh, mm -hmm. Hello, hello, is that working? Yeah? Um, to Ed's point, just a, I had this interesting experience of working with Woody Allen on his first DI, Midnight in Paris, with uh, Darius Kanji. And um, Darius and I did our first pass on the whole movie, and then Woody comes in to review what we had done once Darius felt we were in a good place. And uh, we watched the entire run of the DI in complete silence. Woody <laughs> sat there with his hands on his lap, and then when uh, lights came up, this guy gave us notes from the very first shot of the movie mm all the way through to the end of the movie in order and not like hemming and hawing and, and questioning. He, I had pages and pages and pages of very specific notes and just like that discipline that Woody had from phototech chemically timing and not quite understanding that he was in this DI experience yet. Like it blew our minds. Darius and I both were like, holy cow, like how did he remember all of that stuff? That was a really cool experience. Uh, Bradford, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, the differences in uh, when you're shooting film or when you're shooting digital, how, how the post works, and uh, whether that, uh, that procedure has evolved to, to, you know, to, to uh, a way that you can uh, exercise your creativity in an effective way. Mm, well, I never, you can, can you hear me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, unfortunately, I was on... <clears throat> I trained on film, but I was on the back end. So by the time I got to a point where I was, you know, you know, working in a space where I could uh, do photochemical timing, it was kind of not happening for us. You know, there was this whole, we know it, this whole conversation we keep having like every five years, like it's over. It's over. And then and then Ed scoops up all the gear and says, "It's not over. Wait, I'm gonna." I'm gonna. <laughs> but it, but yeah. So I, unfortunately, I didn't really have a chance to do any photochemical passes on any of my films. You know, I, it, everything. By the time I got to features, it was we would shoot on film, but we were, it, we were in a DI environment, which I, which is a privilege. Honestly, you know, there's a lot to learn from there. <clears throat> uh, so it's hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to have a real uh, educated analysis about it um, as a response to finishing. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, do, I will say one thing about resistance and restraint and this idea that, with, and kind of expanding on what Ed's saying, this idea that, you know, th things are, everything works around this idea of relativity. So it's, there's a certain, certain thing that happens, you sharpen your senses when you're able to, um, work in a particular format or work in a particular creative space, that thing goes away for a while and you come back and create another relationship with it. There is a certain sharpening, a certain there's a certain thing that happens spiritually 
the same, certain thing that happens in the material world that is healthy, that I think we are not, um, we're not, um, we're not, we're not honoring, you know? So for instance, I shot, you know, Joe and I did Pariah together on film, we did Ain't Nobody's Saints on film, and then we didn't do film for, we haven't done film ever since. Oh no, then we did Paul and Sacrifice a little bit, and then Elodie and I did some, with Joe, we did some coloring stuff on, uh, when I was on Space Jam. But it's interesting, the amount of learning and unlearning, and what that does to the, um, the creative spirit, the creative process, the amount of knowledge, that, you know, we, we gain when we're able to um, sort of abandon a relationship with something and re revisit it. It's very healthy, you know? And so I think um, those things we have forgotten, that's a lost art form. It's a lost art form as, because we're artists. We're not just, we're not just technicians, you know? We, we work, our, whole, our, our relationship to color is based on emotion and memory, you know? Like, I think, you know, you've heard me say before, you know, my whole, my whole perception of color is my grandmother's living room. Like, that's where I know color, you know? Mm -hmm. My parent, my grandparents in Louisville, Kentucky, it was a very pastel thing, you know? They, they came from a certain economic environment where they were not interested in color the same way that my grandmother in Chicago, who had her own sort of economic value, the way she was interested in color. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you, and my relationship to color is, is based on that. So it's very personal for me, you know? And that's a vibration that can't be expressed through science, literature, what have you. That's, that's in the med, that's in the spirit. And so yeah. <clears throat> I think this process of like, in this process of resistance in our, in our, in our process is, 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 is healthy. And I think, you know, we don't get a chance to meditate or think about the thing. I know Joe and I always do that. Joe, Joe and I do this thing where we just take walks, you know? Yeah. It's like, we're not great anymore. Let's take a walk around the block and come back. Or in the middle of a scene, Joe's like, go out, step out have a coffee and come back in. And those things, you know, we, I think those are things in our process that really help us sort of, um, uh, that, that are kind of forgotten that I think are good for young people to have now because I think it, it, um, it engages with something very ancient but also engages with something very, con within a contemporary space, you know. Well, you can see that in your images, you know, a most wanted, a most violent year was uh, extraordinary and, and, and there's a deep wisdom in, in those images that's coming from you. And, we can feel that. <laughs> I was just, Ain't Them Body Saints was playing in, on TV uh, two nights ago at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. I got back from one of the parties. I turned on the TV, and, and Saints was uh, playing with Polish uh, dubbing. Oh, which, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was playing here. Oh, that's great. Watch it in the hotel. It was cool. But, you know, I was just to add to what Brad was saying is, is um, thinking about this discussion today and, and, you know, how this would be informative to people. I was like, this is really challenging because it's so like personal and, and, and emotional, like particularly my work with Brad, you know, we just, we just connect. And um, I feel that the cinematographers that have come back to me time and time again, and, and, and Ed is, is like, we just see things the same way. And um, any kind of relationship uh, that a director or cinematographer has with a colorist, it's, it's, you know, you just want someone that has the same taste and the same kind of, um, energy and, and, and vibe to, and like, so I, I'm so appreciative that I've found uh, so many wonderful collaborators and, um, and when we're working together, there doesn't have to be a tremendous amount of conversation because right. like, they're just like, yeah, Joe, you do your thing, you know, and, and at least, you know, in the beginning and then once we get into the details later, um, it's just this level of trust. And then also going from the comfortable confines of a deluxe and technicolor, which were great experiences for me, to then starting Harbor with this idea of like building this 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 environment for filmmakers to feel at home, and the filmmakers to then bring something to Harbor just made the personal experience that much greater for me and the responsibility I felt. So I was like so appreciative. You know, I brought Brad through Harbor when there were no walls up yet, it's like <laughs> saying, "Hey, this is what we're we're doing," mm -hmm. and. Um, and so it is just such a like personal experience. And I'm sure all the cinematographers in here and colorists like know that like they've got their 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 guy or their woman that's like the one that gets it, you mm -hmm. know. So that you're always gonna fight for that colorist and hopefully, you know, hopefully things work out schedule wise and budget and all of that that you can make it work. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Elodie, tell us, you know, about uh, the Irishman 
And uh, you can pick up on any of those threads, you know, the psychology of perception of color, your relation yeah. with Rodrigo and Ivan Lucas on that, the fact that you were shooting film, uh, that you were working with digital, uh, images that were shot film and digital and making them work together. What are your thoughts based on what the other uh, panelists have so, said? Uh, I, uh, um, I want to jump into the conversation, the relation Please between do. the DP and the colorist. And um, for example, with the Irishman, it was, uh, we were working with Rodrigo, um, I started at the lab as well, not as a color timer, but it was the beginning of the TI, but I saw how it works. And from that, I started working like a color timer. I talk about point of color. And that's the language that we have with Rodrigo. So um, when the more you work with the DP, the better you're gonna understand his vision. And so if you speak the same language, then you don't even need to talk after that, mm. kind of. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And, and with Yvonne and, uh, and Rodrigo, you know, tell us about how it worked uh, uh, on that particular project. So for the Irishman, what happened is I was, um, from the beginning of the project, we, me and Yvonne and Matt, we set up the, the look with Rodrigo. So before the, the shoot, we had session to set up the look of the movie because we had four different looks on that project. Um, and then I went to New York and I did the dailies for Rodrigo. So we were in constant communication every day about the look that he wanted for each scene. And then after that, when the DI happened last summer, uh, we all three were working all together. Um, so it's a, it was very, like we had two rooms and Rodrigo was going from one room to another to work with us. Mm -hmm. So he was doing a scene with Yvonne, then he was doing a scene with me and then checking what Yvonne did and then going back and forth in the room. Mm -hmm. yeah. Matt, you know, tell us about how that, uh, that, that, that process has evolved. It seems to me, you know, that it's more natural for color to be something that's considered and supported by the science throughout the project, rather than something that comes in segments. The cinematographer imagines things, it, you know, figures out how to achieve it, uh, comes to a post-production, uh, you know, then there's dailies, then there's post-production. No, it's one process. How does the science support what these people are talking about? Well, I mean, first I, I'd like to take a step back because this is actually a really amazing experience for me because I get to be the nerd in the room. <laughs> you know, like, and we can't do it without the nerd. And, and, yeah. and it's it's actually really cool because I, I love I love hearing this conversation of of like we're here to tell stories and we're here to tell stories and we're we're focusing in on. You know, color tells a story, and that, that drives emotion and, and can take us to places just as strongly as music can or, or, or framing and, and these kind of things. And, and one of my, you know, I, it, I'm the color scientist. I'm the guy that people go, okay, well, what's the math? How can I get this look? Get me in there. And, and my favorite part is actually to sit with all of these people, and before things start, before makeup and hair anything let's what do you want what do you want like where are we going with this you know what, what do we want to say do you have do you have reference oh i really like this movie can i, I kind of want to pick up on this from that other movie from the 70s or you know for the irishman rodrigo brought books and books of of reference of i want you know i want for one decade of the movie it's it's this look and i and on this page i like what this red is doing in the skin tones here, and another decade I like what the, the shadows are doing here in the skies, and, and then I, you know, it's my job to be that kind of Rosetta Stone, that, that interpreter, if I can. So, you know, there's, there's this idea of like, I'm, I'm the color scientist, I'm, I'm the super nerd, but the, my real job is to try to get inside your head. Mm. My job is to understand how you think. So if I can understand how, the colors things and and the DPs and the creatives that come on and then hopefully as time goes on I can get that shorthand too and and I can go I get it I get it I get it now I'm gonna go run away to my little cubby hole for an hour and I'm gonna build some stuff and I'm gonna come back and let's take a look at it and you, and then then the feedback starts happening where it's like okay yes I like this but I don't like that okay great and and the tools are so strong now that a lot of these like I can start the process, but then, but uh, then Joe and Elodie can can keep going with it, and it, can, it becomes this interactive 
uh, almost like a, a recording session, if you will. And, you know, and they're, they're driving things in directions in real time. No, what about this? Let's change this. Let's change that. And there are moments where like, the colors, they can get so far, and they're not quite getting it just because the tools are, are what they are. But I can have other tools. I go, OK, hold on. I see where you're going. I'm going to run away. And I go out, and I'm going to come back in 10 minutes. And you guys keep playing. I come back, and I come up. Here's three more options. Try this. Boom, 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 boom. And, and you might go, yeah, OK, I like number two. Let's mix 50% of number two with 20% of number one. And that's, that's this decade of the show. It's that intense. <laughs> so, so you know, it, and so you know, like I love the concept of, of the psychology and the art of it. I, I, let, you know, because my my whole job in this whole thing, my my my, I am here to serve in this respect. And um, it, you know, if I'm doing it really well, then maybe I'm up front. I love being up front. I love being in there with you. But then I can, you know, I there's a point where I step back. And you know, I, I kind of fall into the shadows because all the technical, if I'm, if I'm doing my job right, the technical setup, and then, and then the DI, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it even back further. I'm gonna say, we're in this day and age where the DI starts at the dailies. You know, we're not, we're not just, oh, let's get out there and do some dailies and figure it out later. And let's figure it out up front. Let's, let's like, there's some ideas that were floating here and let's, let's, let's riff on that. Now we can always change our mind later on. We have that flexibility because we're smart people and we can set ourselves up to do that. But if we can get as much of this up front as we can, then, then the entire process becomes smoother because then the look that, that's uh, rolling in the mind of what we want this to be in the end is already percolating with people and they're falling in love with it. As opposed to, let's just throw a LUT on there and we'll blast through some dailies and we'll figure it out later. But, if we can all just kind of encapsulate it, that that's that's where some real magic can happen. Um, so yeah, that's where I stand. <laughs> Great. I wanted to ask, you know, uh, Ed and, and Bradford. Pardon? No. Okay. I, I just to, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just want to be contrary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this first round is what I think we all go into the process with. But it's really the practicality of how we come out with the results. And uh, I think that's going to be more um, helpful for people. And the problem is, and you're, you're a great navigator of that, what happens when you go in the color correct with the, the cameraman and the director, and they have oppositional points of view, which can happen in Look, the most important thing I find to do is to get your dailies as close to what you feel the look as uh, that you want so they see it in the editing room. Because if they see dailies off in the editing room, invariably the director is going to say, that's the way they were in the editing room, that's what I want. So I, I painfully, even if I have to go in at, at night or early in the morning before dailies, to try to get the uh, dailies as close to what I think the look should be. Well, what happens then when the director on the Avid starts changing the color or the density because they think that's the way it could look, or they don't like the screenings that they're uh, testing the film at, so they try to make changes in the Avid, and they bring that to the color session. Then you're in this dilemma of saying, well, but that isn't what we did, but, but yeah, but that's what I want. So how does Joe, and that's why I continually go back to Joe, navigates that between the cinematographer and the director to come up with a solution to what they supposedly both want? Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Not go, to put Joe. you on the seat. Yeah. Go, Joe. No, I feel like... Um, you know, I could probably go back and get my doctorate in psychology. Yeah. You know, when you're in the room managing different expectations, that I mean, that's ninety percent of the job. And um, but there's certainly hurdles. You know, like Ed's saying, you sometimes they crank up the brightness of the monitors in the edit suite, particularly on your movies. <laughs> we get in there like, what is that? Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're fighting against that uh, in the DI, for sure. I, I see that on almost every movie. You know, the cinematographer and I sit together 
uh, for you know a couple days, hopefully, and 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 it, it just kind of falls in. They're like, yeah, this is the way it should be. We're usually working in printer lights, trying to keep this kind of organic approach because I'm not trying to like pull the image apart. You know, we do the first two three passes, contrast, red, green, and blue, and uh, and everyone's like, great, this is it. And then when the director and the editor come in, it's not what they have been looking at for a couple of months. Like that can happen, even if the dailies are great. Um, you know, you know, they jack up the brightness on the monitor, and so there is always this process of them getting getting them kind of reacclimated to what the cinematographer's intention was. Because um, I always think it's interesting that the DP's coming in and they haven't been watching it every day for eight months, like the director and the editor have. Um, and that's why, like at Harbor, you know, we have a lot of editing suites at Harbor, so a lot of shows are, are cutting there, and so I'm able to communicate uh, with the editor and the director. I'm talking to them for months, and they may just route their Avid into my DI theater, and we can watch rough cuts and stuff like that and get the conversation going earlier, so hopefully you can kind of pull them into, uh, you know, what the aesthetic might be months or weeks ahead of, of the final DI. But yeah, I mean, to what Ed's saying, that's, that's definitely that temp love is always an issue. And I think it was a bigger issue even on, on film with Red 709 dailies and stuff like that. Like now, you know, everyone's seeing the LUT, you know, we'll, I'll build a custom show LUT for Brad or for, for Ed and that's on the monitor on set. And, and so like at least everyone is seeing the intent uh, earlier on, so I think it has actually gotten better than Telecine dailies. You know, you'd get they'd show you something on their laptop in Rec 709 that maybe had some weird gamma, and you'd be looking at your P3 display up on the on the on the screen, and they just you know you couldn't get them to match necessarily because the intent that they were they had from their rough cut was never that that wasn't what was intended by the cinematographer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add for the Irishman, that's what happened when uh, we really wanted to have the dailies to be as perfect as we could, and the DI started at the dailies. The whole environment was controlled of where they were seeing the dailies. Rodrigo had a, t a monitor that was exactly the same that I was working on. The director had the same monitor that Matt calibrated, so everyone would see the same image. And so when we started the DI, everything from the daily is transferred to the DI, and we started from that, and then we upgraded the image. But, and, and I can tell you, like, every single um, session that we had with the director, there was that, that uh, question, like, can I see the dailies? So we compared all the time to the dailies, because that's what they are familiar with. So it was very important to start from the dailies to, to have the look of the movie already. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a, it's, it's a fight. <laughs> yeah, can I add to that? Yeah. Just just to add to that, within in relation to specifically to that question, in relation to the Irishman, when Elodie was saying that yeah the day the DI actually started in dailies, that includes I mean this, the dailies were not CDL based. We were actually using the tools of the actual you know the fully tool set of the DI. So one could say that the DI actually began and actually transferred into the VFX world and transferred into the DI. So it all rolled together. And that concept of you know looking at a display and then you look at another display and it, it's not working right. We were, you know, we're we're at that stage now where hopefully we're not really having that conversation as much because if we're doing our jobs right, we're mapping these shows into the proper displays, we're controlling those environments, and then then the the people who have the critical eye are seeing things as they should be intended to be seen. So, you know, it's this concept of, of in, from the beginning, even before daily start, being the shepherd of the show all the way through from the beginning to the end. So that creative intent, which is all pinnacle, is maintained. So hopefully you have as few conversations of the, this isn't where I wanted to go, as possible. Now the human factor of we may ch we changed our minds. I now want to go in this other direction is always viable, and that's and it's always maneuverable, and that's kind of where we stand. You know, I we, I am water. I flow, so we can we could we can do all that. Mm -hmm. 
Bradford, any thoughts along those lines about intent and uh, uh, how to uh, navigate that difficult period where the director and the editor are looking at these images for a long time and getting maybe getting used to something that's a little different from what you had intended? Yeah, well, I was, I was having a lot of thoughts as, as everybody was speaking. I mean, I think, I mean, and this is this is this isn't this isn't the way that it happens. I'm gonna say this not with the assumption that this is the way it is going to always happen, but because we are still lumpy proletariats, like we gotta go get work and take care of our families and stuff. But so we don't always we can't always do what I'm proposing, which is this is why I think fundamentally, and this is I think this addresses a lot of issues fundamentally. This is the reason why community building is important, right? We work in an art form that's very, very collaborative. And in that collaboration, we have to manage a lot of personalities. And <clears throat> I think the thing that, the reason why I'm advocating for community building is because what it does is that it gives community building, collective building, whatever you want to call it, it gives everybody a sense of ownership of the thing that they do. And what people in the co collective or what people in the community have to do is that we all agree that that individual or that person is the expert or the most knowledgeable person around this thing, right? So, with, with, but what happens in film is because it's not, it's, it's driven so hard by capitalism, it doesn't allow us, the concept of collective, you know, uh, positioning or community building is kind of a dead concept, you know, it doesn't, we don't have communes anymore, we don't do stuff together anymore, we all, we shift, we, we jump from job to job. If you're that cinematographer that gets to work with the same director over and over again, that's a blessing, right? So this whole idea of like, for me, I think one of the remedies is like building community, building a collective consciousness around what it is we're doing, you know? And I think when we can do that, yes, we will not always agree, yes, we will evolve. Like, listen, I evolved from the time I start the film until the time that I'm done with the film, Joe can tell you, by the time I'm done with the film, I kind of don't want to be in the DI because I've done all the hard work on the days, right? And my thing now is, well, you know, don't have to talk to me, talk to Zach or Joe. You know what I mean? They, they, they are an extension of what we built from the jump. And the director gave us the literature. So every image that's created on screen comes from the story, right? So these cats that are involved in the process of coloring your image have been inoculated with your story because I gave them the shot and they are carriers of the story. So it's this whole idea that what we want is different from what the director wants is, 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 is not acceptable knowledge. I don't accept that. And the reason why I don't accept that, but, but, but the reason, but, but I don't accept that, but the reason I can accept that is because we're not building community. And I'm only pushing this idea of building community because when I look out in the audience, there are a lot of young faces and I see a lot of people who I know are trying to make film make sense in the 21st century reality. And I think this conundrum of like, I mean, Joe and I have done, I'm just gonna I'll just share it with, you know, oh, yeah. very transparent. Joe and I have done two films, now three films, where it's just like, I'm not, well, I'm already assuming because we didn't build community or the community fell apart in the process, I probably should not come to the DI because <laughs> I'm going to be an emotional factor in the room that might not render the image in the way that it should be. I can accept that. So maybe Joe and the director should be together in the room. And honestly, it's no loss. You know what I'm saying? It's no loss, right? Because if you're building community, everybody says, yeah, you're emotional. You can't handle this right now because you've put so much into it. Let me sit with this person, Joe, who happens to be in the community building context, the most psychologically stable, the most logical, the person, <laughs> no really, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That person that has their finger on the balance of the art and the science, right? And I would love to hear Ed build on this, but like, hasn't the color timer, hasn't the colorist always been sort of the psychologist anyway, right? Because they're the person that brings the final iteration, the final synthesis in this dialectics of making film. They're like the final missing link. And so we should, let that person own that, right? We should let that person take, uh, be entitled with that title, be entitled with that sense of empowerment mm -hmm. and let them bring, for me, which is a blessing of working with Joe is, for me, it's like the whole idea of not even talking about the image anymore, like this whole idea, like Joe and I don't even have to talk anymore. For me, I'm just sure, I'm just excited because I know Joe, Joe works with a lot of folks that I admire, 
You know what I mean? And Joe works with a lot of cats that I don't know who he's learned a lot from. And so for me, I'm benefiting from Joe's knowledge of working with the previous cinematographer, the previous director. So let Joe do his thing. He's gonna, we're going to find it. And if it's not right, either instinctually he'll know it's not right based on the story or we'll tell him it's not right. But I think, you know, this idea of collective building, community building is really important because it, um, it sort of puts the control back into the hands. Because, you know, cinematography, we can advocate for ourselves in, um, in really rigid ways, but I don't think that is going to settle the issue. I think what's going to settle the issue is when we decide we're doing this together, and before we even talk about how we're gonna tackle this film visually, let's talk about how we're gonna tackle this film psychologically, like how are we gonna tackle this film as a community? And I'll just say this one last thing and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> this thing, I keep, there's another thing I was thinking about too, this idea of language, right? This keeps coming up, visual language, the language of color, right? The language of, the language of color science. Arrival was about language. Right, arrival's yeah. about, like, this whole idea of like language for me is also important because you know, I'm an institutionalized filmmaker. Like, I went to film school, so my language around filmmaking is colonized. Like, I'm using the same language that filmmakers have been using for 100 years, but, but I don't owe anybody any of that. I don't owe anybody any of that. What I owe is my own, I owe, I owe myself to create my own grammar, my own language, which is very specific. Like, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. That's not the same language that Ed's going to have. You know what I mean? We're very different, but you have to, create the language because the language is what ultimately at the end of the day is, is what propels uh, what I think is the, um, the collective consciousness around uh, how we're going to, how we're going to move, move, through the, move through this process, you know? And, and, um, and it's important for people to know and understand and speak the language so that, you know, we understand that we're all working toward, you know, towards, towards the same thing. If I could expand on that yeah. too is... Um, Go ahead, Joe. Um, my relationship with Brad, you know, he comes in and he's like, it's yours now, Joe. Like, I already did my thing, now, like, I give it to you. And that, like, responsibility is crazy. He's like, I'm gonna, you know, go take care of some things, I'll be back at the end of the day. But, like, he really gives me that space and that time to, to interpret the images myself. And, and so I'm just like, it's like, fuck, man, it's like, what am I gonna do? You know, this is a, a huge responsibility, but um, uh, I so appreciate that trust and then to what Brad's point about just like us being in this business and 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 the community um, you know I, it's that's what Harbor's all about the community and, and if I'm doing some kind of studio project that's like a romantic comedy or something that has its own aesthetic and its own you know uh, look and responsibility you have to adapt and 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 do that and, and that's a fantastic thing um, but then I feel like I'm grounded again when I'm doing a Jim Jarmusch project and, and like the, the relationship I have with Jim or with Ed and Todd and with Bradford, like that's like, that's the roots for me, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, I feel so grateful that I can kind of like go in and out of those, those worlds, you know, like doing certain projects that, mm -hmm. um, with the uh, commercial appeal and everything of them and that's all great. And then being in New York, like I'm so glad I, stayed as a New York colorist and to have like the filmmakers uh, that come to New York that really to me like that's 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 my aesthetic like I'm really grounded in in, in you know what Ed does and Brad does and, and certainly everything with Jim like that that's what I'm all about well I would like to say that I wish I could be half as eloquent as Bradford he just blew in eight hours from Baltimore he hasn't slept or anything but he's here <laughs> he's laying and on it's beautiful and, and I would, you know, I, one of the things that I thought of as you were talking, Bradford and Joe, was that we're building, we're hoping to build this community as part of what Camera Image is about. We're all here together. Maybe we should try to do this more often than once a year, you know. But, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, part of building that community is having that common language, and part of having that common language is the film history. Mm -hmm. And another thing that, you know, Joe brings is this deep knowledge of the film history, because partly because of all of the work you've done with Criterion. And I know that Ed has helped you on some of that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that and yeah. uh, the history and the color and, uh, and, and how it supports what you do and what we all do today. Yeah, that's another tremendous responsibility. So I, I started off as a commercial colorist. Um, 
Michelle Suisa here got me started really doing commercials and stuff uh, in New York back in the day. Um, and then I got introduced to the Criterion Collection. They brought me Solaris, you know, and, uh, and um, it's like, yeah, getting started with <laughs> such a, uh, a film like, like that. Uh, but, you know, working off an IP and uh, working with these amazing filmmakers, all of a sudden, you know, I go from being this 30 second spot guy to sitting with, you know, Robert Altman or, uh, you know, Tak Fujimoto and Jonathan Demi and all these people. And I was like, now this, like, this is cool. Like, I really <laughs> am enjoying that. And, you know, and Wes Anderson actually, um, um, you know, doing a bottle rocket with him. And, um, and so developing your eye off of working on these kind of photo photochemically timed films um, really, like, just keeps, keeps my head, I feel like, in the right space when it comes to even doing uh, DIs today. Ed, do you want to talk a little bit about the Douglas Sirk films or working with Joe, or do you have any comments about what Bradford said? I, I like what Bradford said, but I, I think it has to be based on respect. And um, so the communal um, idea has to be that there's a respect amongst each other for it to work. So w when it breaks down is when there isn't respect. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously working with Joe, even in the last film I did with him, it was very interesting because he was a mediator in a certain sense to the point was, we'll let Joe do a pass and then we'll see. <laughs> so I gave Joe my notes on the side and right. he did his pass and then everything was perfect. <laughs> but if I hadn't done that, if I, if I had fought that, I would have been in problems. So you're right, um, I've heard about Sometimes the hardest part is to step back and let things take their natural course, but sometimes you have to influence those things. <laughs> or at least that's been always my process. I, 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 when I, I said this the other day, when I was younger, I, I had to figure out how to do things my way. And as I got older, I learned I could do them differently. I didn't have to do it my way, but I could figure out a way to do it a different way through someone else's vision. Mm. And, uh, but, but it, you still have to like, when you put up, you know, it's the Zen idea. If you put up one fist next to another, there's a fight. If you release it, you have the chance of going further. Mm. Now, the, the, the criterion, th this is always interesting. You know, people that are archivists, they, they're in a whole thing about, like, that you can't alter their image, you know, so what means would they have had that you have that's different? Let's say Windows. So when I did, uh, like, Written on the Wind and uh, Far From, well, not Far From Heaven, All, All Heaven, Heaven Allows, allows. Yeah. You know, I looked at that, and, and there was really a lot of inconsistencies. They, you know, they shot those films in a back lot 18 days, and I'm sure they timed those films in, like, less than a week, and probably they didn't even have Russell Meddy or come in and, and time it. So when I looked at it, uh, of course, I relinquished and did the things that I thought would make the film look better, because I, in my mind, I said, well, if Russell Meddy was here, he would have done those things. So I did alter it, but I altered it in a way that I felt was in, in keeping with what the look of the film was. Those Douglas Sirk films were crazy too. Ed and I were going through them and it's like, wow, there's a lamp with like a purple light bulb inside of it. And there's like some big shot of like pink light across a wall with the hard shadow. It was like, it's just so cool to like go back to those movies uh, as a colorist and get, you know, sink your teeth into them and, and the, you know, you, you absorb kind of that, that influence. Um, but those, those were a lot of fun uh, to go back to. And then we also did um, Virgin Suicides and uh, True Stories and uh, also just like a fantastic treat. And now those, so Ed shot those films, so we did have more opportunity to kind of play with some of the DI tools because you know these were his images to kind of do as he pleased with.
Oh, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, another question that comes up with, with this tremendous control that comes along uh, with the DI is, you know, how much is too much? I find that with digital art, you know, the, often the question is, when do you stop? And, uh, you know, for I think for a while there, there were a lot of films. I talked to cinematographers who, you know, observing films and saying that maybe they're over-manipulated. And, uh, and, and part of that, I think, was the technology. Uh, uh, we've gotten better, I feel, at uh, hiding that. And, uh, but we've also gotten better at the, the choices, right? Um, uh, when is something over-manipulated? When is it too perfect, Joe? Uh, that's something we were talking about earlier. I'll never be accused of having my work too perfect, <laughs> and, and on purpose. You know, we, we don't overwork the negative. Um, certainly the first couple of passes, setting that, that tone, uh, you know, again, we said like printer lights, or try to keep it organic, you know, the, the lighting, the, the exposure, everything, the production, um, the, the effort that they put in, like it's, it's already there in the negative, so, you know, this kind of pulling the shadows this way and pulling the highlights that way. Um, I try to avoid that in the beginning. And then, um, to your point, movies are so just technically proficient now um, that they somehow, some to some degree, they kind of all look the same. And it, it's nice, like Brad and I like to like kind of beat it up a little bit. Not, not by like making it more perfect, but like how do we just make it feel a little more alive, maybe a little less perfect, you know, so things need to, things need to cut, <clears throat> but maybe the look on this shot um, doesn't, isn't a literal match with the next shot, but hey, this looks better, and that looks better, and it flows, and um, like, kind of that approach, I think, is helping the projects that we do together have like, a little bit of life, a little bit of um, kind of organic, you know, feel to them, rather than keying and separating every little element, um, you know, and the, the type of projects that we do together, I think, allow for that aesthetic, you know, Brad's already got a body of work, like, people have a certain sense of, like, what it should look like, and, and we don't do that by pulling the image apart with all of these tools. Yeah, but, I, you know, one thing, one thing I'll say about the whole overworked image, I kind of don't, I think that's not, I don't know, how should I say this? I don't, that for me, that for me is, is that, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if that exists, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if that's a real thing to me, you know? I think, um, <clears throat> we all see light, shadow, color, contrast, different, you know what I mean? And what I do know is that there's several things that happen. There's like, you're in the room and because you know I'm 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 a I'm a lover like obsessed with hip hop. So for me, sampling and appropriating things is a really important gesture to paying homage. There are many layers to that. I know it's very complicated, but you know there's either several things happening, and I say that to say that there's several things happening. People are either in the room and then they are trying to pay homage or appropriate or think about things that they've seen that they really love and they really want to, especially when you're young, you know what I mean? Especially when you're just trying to formulate identity, which is really what I really want to get to. Which you, you do things that are, that, that, you, that you feel like are getting you closer to understanding your truth as an image maker. And you, because you might not be at that point in your process where you can talk about how hard it is to unpack your own personal story Let's say when you take a 14th century Dutch painting and you cut it in half and you look at it microscopically from the side, like everybody's black is different, right? You can see that in the, the black that they made because they had to make the color black. You can see everybody's black is different because of their preference. Like that meta inside of it is a truth that only that person, that's a lot, it requires a lot of hard, requires a lot of hard work. But if it's a milkier black versus a, a black that's more red versus more blue, working that for me is like, that's the interesting part. So I think the, the process is like we get in the room and we're, we're paying homage. We're trying to figure out when we can declare that meta inside of our black or that meta inside of our red, which is why color science is so interesting now is because I can give you a photograph of my grandmother. I can give you a photograph of an ancestor and say, I need the skin tone to look like this in these scenes. Like that's incredible control, right? But 
according to popular knowledge, I may be like overworking the image, but what I'm saying is that what I feel like is just getting us closer to what we really want this thing to do for us, which is cinematographers, I would love to hear Ed talk about it, or Mr. Pope. Like, cinematographers, we don't, we don't get the experience always as actors do of reaching that moment of euphoria on set. We're working, right? We're working, we're just trying to make the shot happen, get the day, da 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 da. And every now and then, you feel like John Coltrane and you're like, I, I reached, I've played that note, and now I'm in ascension, right? Every now and then, right? But it requires, it requires, in order for you to get to that point, it requires a certain exploration of like the small gestures. Like, I like what Tarkovsky is about. I like what Haile Garim is about. I like what Ed Lachman's about. You know what I mean? I like what Betsy Sarr is about. Like you, you appropriate, you appropriate those those things, right? And those things kind of render themselves in the in the DI suite. I'm just using it because of digital technology. I think is a really interesting way of putting it. Digital technology allows us to like fool around with that. That's that's before we start running. And then when we're ready to run, and we because we've appropriated all of these things, we're ready to run. Like we lean the image far, far, far to the left. So the contrast compared to whomever, yeah, it's not. Not their, it's not their gesture, but this is my gesture. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah, the highlights are explosive, but this is my gesture. Mm -hmm. I do truly believe that 99.9% .9 of us are trying to reach that point as an image maker where we're, we're having that conversation with something that is deeply, deeply personal. That's really hard to express to even the colorist or the director or even your parents or your family, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to reach that thing that's really deep. So I, for me, this whole idea of overworking image, doesn't really exist because who am I to say it's overwork? Overwork based on what? IRE scales? Overwork based on what? Quality control by an institution that has to meet its own parameters? That's not my quality, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think these are things that, you know, I think are the conundrum of the contemporary environment which you're making film where, you know, I just, whatever you gotta do to get to that point where Maybe you shed a tear, or maybe uncontrollable laughter, or maybe you go home and make love to your partner differently, or whatever it is, like, whatever you need to do to get to that, I think that's what this moment has given us the privilege of doing. Listen, I'm taught by filmmakers that literally used to have their negative hostage in the lab, because they couldn't afford to get their negative out. <coughs> forget, forget, bending, forget, the technical difficulties of bending an image one way or the other, they couldn't even get their negative out. Mm -hmm. The LA Rebellion filmmakers couldn't even make their film. To Sleep With Anger and Killer of Sheep was sitting in the lab for like 10, you know what I mean? Like it had to be excavated in order for us to see the film. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, these are all these baby steps that get us to, what I think is really important now about this time is that we can really get down to the super, super, uh, the meta of it, that is beyond the quality, beyond the quality control of it. Super. Okay, can I, can cool I jump, jump in, in on that? From, you know, yeah. from a slightly different perspective, but I'm gonna roll right in, in that. You know, the idea of, of overworking an image, you know, my, my, from a color scientist, probably a, a very odd thing to, to ask, but like, you know, is Picasso overworking an image? No. Is Monet overworking an image? You know, these are, these are just different images, and these are different artists. And, and we, I think we are now in this day and age where it's super exciting because there are so many tools to tell the story from a color aspect, from like, exactly, do I want reds in my blacks? Do I want blacks, black, neutral blacks, blue blacks? Do I want blacks that were emulating a 70 millimeter print from 1972? You know, that's, these are the questions we get to ask. We get to say things like, you know what? I want Fuji Hikon highlights, but I want vision from 1983 in my skin tones. But at the bottom, I like nice, clean blacks. Mm -hmm. We're never in a time where we able to have that much control over what we're actually saying. And here's the super incredibly part that, you know, that just I live for is that the last thing that I ever want to say to one filmmaker is, let's make your movie look exactly like that other person's movie. No, like, your movie should be absolutely unique. This should be telling the story that you're telling, and it should have the qualities that are, that are unique to this story, to this movie. So let's create that. And, because, and, and, you know, it is, yes, it is a crime 
that film is not with us as it was 20 years ago. But we do have a lot of knowledge from that. We do have uh, a lot of expertise and a lot of reference that we can pick up on. But here's the beautiful thing about it is that once, when I started in this DI world in you know, the early 2000s, it was, the question was not what do you want your movie to look like, it was do you want it to be on Vision stock or Fuji stock? <laughs> and it was about emulating those. Right. And, and the tools were, were you know, they were, they were still extremely robust in comparison to just printer lights, which is what was available 20 years previously to that. But we just, we're just expanding, expanding, expanding. Now, you're getting into this moral conversation of not only, you know, it's, it's the Jurassic Park, you know, it's not a can we, it's should we. And, and you know, the answer really from, my, from a science kind of perspective is it doesn't matter. Because if it can, somebody's doing it. Right. You know, morally, that's up to you. Theologically, does it work with the story you're trying to tell? Well, if it does, let's go for it. And this is the craziest thing that I've learned once I started working with people like Bradford and going into Harvard and some of the shows that I've been working on. Um, I was raised with the idea of mathematical perfection. You know, the, there was a line that one of my, my mentors would use where like everything's perfect is when everything's right, it's a straight line. And that is super true because that's when you allow yourself, you don't get into problems. You don't run into issues of, oh my God, my image just broke when I'm trying to go this route. But what the, the beauty of being up here with this panel is every person who's sitting here is a master of their domain. And when you're a master of your domain, that means and what you're hitting upon, the point that you're hitting on is, are you following the rules? And if you know the rules, you know how to break the rules. And you know how to ride that razor's edge to get to where you want to go, but be, but be where you should be. So it, I've really come to this concept within the past year and a half, I would say, of as an imaging scientist, as a color scientist, embracing imperfection because we can mm. and if you know the rules if you know what you sh what the boundaries that you can hit you can get right up there and when you get up right into the ether of it all that's where some exciting things can happen and and that's you know this concept of community and collaboration i am such a huge fan of it because together we may go to places that individually we right. never would have thought. You know, discussions with any one of you will lead me to go, oh my God, I've never thought of that before. I'm going to go sit down with Excel and I'm going to try to write out some equations to try to get this to work. Mm. And, and that's part of the, the process. And that's what I, I just find it is very exciting in our time. And just, you know, with a lot of young filmmakers out here, you know, there's a lot of, op there's, it's hard, but there's a lot of opportunities as well. You know, I, when I was, I went to film school, just like you. I, w I came into film school and it was, I learned on film, but I came into the industry within the digital revolution. Things like YouTube didn't exist for me. There's a lot of opportunity in those kind of realms. Hmm. A lot of places to explore. So, you know, I, I, think, I think this concept of, you know, are we over-processing things? I think a lot of it is based on exploration. And, and if we can have these conversations of where we want to explore to, perhaps it can be a little bit more controlled. But the idea of we're here to play, I think that's, that, that's what drives me. Well, when I look at an image from Bradford or Dick Pope, what I'm interested in is the personal experience that they're having with the image. So maybe that's my analog head but it's not something you can create in post. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't put scratches in and say that works, or you put dust in or on the frame line or a hair. You would spend, you, you would never reproduce the immediacy of a William Eggleston image or a Robert Frank image because he misfocused, and the misfocus in that image says everything about that image. So that, that, that's why I'm against what we think we can do in post, because it loses the authenticity 
of what the image represents in the moment. Mm. Uh, do you have thoughts? Any thoughts on this? Uh... Yeah, I would say for, um, when we work with uh, with Rodrigo and we set up the look, uh, so we have four, four different looks, and we talked about the Kodak room, and we so we had books, and we had this idea also that what is the Kodak room, and what he had in mind was maybe different than someone else. And so we, based on what he was saying to us, we created the look that he had in mind for the Kodak room. It might not be the same for you, it might not be the same for you. So it's very personal um, things that you create with the relation with the, with the DP when you start building those looks and using the technology that we have today to recreate that. Also, it's what you feel, it's what your memory brings to you, and, and that by itself is open to anything mm. and changes with time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I would, agree, I would agree even to Ed's point, you know, the, um, as a colorist, you've got to um, adapt to every new project and every new filmmaker, you know, and, and understand kind of how far they want to take it in the DI or not, uh, or the tools that they might want to use. Like, I feel like when, when Ed and I are working together, we are pushing the image, like some, some intent, uh, you know, certainly with uh, color balance and stuff like that. It's an impressionistic kind of image and it's so much fun, but, um, but we're, not, we're not using the kind of tools uh, to really pull it apart into, you know, windowing faces and, and popping out eyeballs and, and things like that. Like, we don't get into that, but we are still very much, um, you know, pushing a, a, a look into the into the images um, and then and so as a colorist like that's kind of the first thing I have to understand um, when I'm working with filmmakers for the first time is kind of uh, what their goals are and um, and how much of my kind of um, interpretation they're interested in versus like oh okay I'm pushing buttons for this person for the next you know two weeks and that's fine too because they they know what they want, and, and, and so like as a colorist, you're constantly having to pivot and adapt to you know every new project. But I also just appreciate then the ones that I collaborate with time and time again because I know going into it what you know what I'm getting into, um, which is such a pleasure. Great. Um, we've got about a half hour left, so uh, let's uh, open it up to questions. Do we have a microphone for the crowd? I don't know if we do or not. Okay. Oh, thanks, Gabby. Ashley has a question right here in row two. Yeah. <laughs> G'day. Uh, this is a question for Bradford and Joe. So I've read a few interviews of yours, Bradford, where you spoke about um, how integral your relationship with Joe is in creating your look and considering you work so much in the shadows. I'm wondering if you can speak to how you work together in order to be able to, you know, essentially work in those shadows together. Mm -hmm. Go, Joe. <laughs> he has a secret, uh, I can tell. Our, no, because our mantra is always, well, what would Harris do? <laughs> you know, that, we, that, that gets said over and over in the DI theater. You know, it's like, hmm, you know, what, what would Harris Savides think about this? Uh, yeah, because that's just such a huge inspiration for, for both of us. Um, uh, as, as probably everybody here, you know, mm. um, Harris is the best. Mm. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's it's also the the negative that Brad gives me to work with is so fantastic and so unique and thin um, and thin. I was like, uh, it's it, I was fortunate enough to do a number of projects with Harris, and it's it feels like Harris is negative. Where like I hope I hope this is what they like because it really can't be much of anything else. Uh, but we'll 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 construct a show like. You know, for every uh, every show, Brad will shoot a bunch of tests, and and we'll come up with, uh, you know, like a certain uh, vibe and look uh, within um, the constraints of, of of the show let that Brad will shoot through. And when I see his offlines and they look beautiful, I'm like, wow! Like, did you guys do a lot of dailies grading? And Brad's like, no, man, that's that's just the let, like, you know, nothing else. And uh, and he's such a master, like, of just dialing everything in on set with the lighting and, and his exposure and everything and, and it's like it's a, such a, a pleasure then for us when we're 
putting the finishing touches on. He's got his hip hop and his jazz going, and it's it's all nuance. That's the other thing we say a lot. It's just like the, like we are going to elevate the film, but the ways that Brad and I move it together uh, aren't always apparent to everyone else in the room. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think you know, the, what's interesting was, you know, we. The thing that the digital it was what's funny about the digital thing is that you know. You know, we we have this like old we have this knowledge about, or I have this knowledge. We have this shared knowledge about how do you expose an image, and and you know most of the times I'm thinking about it in a very filmic negative kind of way, and I'm also thinking about it in a very reactionary way, right? Like I don't want, I don't, I don't the option has been made. We've made the choice. You know, as Ed Ed is, is is teaching us. You know, we make the choice. I made the choice on the day because something happened in the room and that felt like the right thing, and I don't want to unpack that. I don't want to undo that. It has imp- how. However imperfect that is, I don't want to do that. Um, but was was, and because I'm trying because I'm trying to use that old film make film making shooting film knowledge energy where everybody is hyper focused and there's this particular way of doing it, particular movement happening around happening around that. Um, you know, we bring that to the when we bring that sort of knowledge to the DI. What happens is that it becomes really apparent quickly that like, especially the way we work that. Um, the digital DIs aren't really in certain levels, which we're learning a lot, is that DIs as a response to skin tone and shadow, we don't have tools. We don't have we don't there are there are there are tools that don't exist that can help undo or redo things that we some of the troubles we have. Like in solo, we were in trouble, you know what I mean? Because we we it was that conundrum of like the negative looks this way, but it's gonna honor all these other things that I didn't want to be conscious of. We had to be conscious of, and then on top of that, 85% of the shot is a visual effects takeover. Where ILM tried and did a wonderful job of trying to follow the photography, but when you when those bridges come together, there because it is in that pixel. We're dealing with pixels. It is in that space. It does it does suspend or it does excuse the immediacy of the thing that's so imperfect in the moment, right? Because then we what we want what we end up wanting to do is bend and manipulate the pixels to sort of make this perfect match. What we're finding is that things fall apart really quickly. So it, our process is literally like, let's say, for instance, like, where's Kira? Which I'm sure like nobody saw that film in here. <laughs> <laughs> where's Kira is, you know, it was what it was. You know what I mean? It wasn't much. We couldn't, because the danger of trying to take it one way or the other would mean that it would, there would not be an image. You know what I mean? It would be that high level of decay that couldn't, that wouldn't make it a film. It wouldn't be saying the story wouldn't be there as it was intended on the day. Um, so for us, it's like there are certain points. I think there's certain spaces in the image that are we don't touch because you got to nail it on the day, and that nailing it on the day has to come with a high level of intention and purpose. And a lot of what we do is revisit. You know, for me, I consider my. You know, I, th- I think about building a body of work. So. <coughs> I'm picking films that will allow me to continue some of the conversations I was having on the previous film with my photographer, right? And so, you know, we're just kind of like chipping away at a thing and, and making notes, you know? Like Joe's always saying, oh man, you wouldn't believe it. I was doing the show with Ed and I got this modifier that did this thing to the skin tone. I'd be interested to see what it would, how it would help us on the next film, you know? And then that's that shared knowledge, that community, right? And we see, if, oh, that worked this time. Okay, well, you know, so there's all, th- we're always addressing the same thing. It's like the shadows, the milkiness in the shadows, which I love, and where skin tone is down in that zone where it kind of falls apart, and how can we make that more filmic, and how can we how can that be um, a, like a higher manifestation of what was intended on the day when when, we, when I was actually doing the photography? You know? mm-hmm. uh, Michael. So you guys referenced um, a few times building a community, and I think some of it was in reference to how you build that community on, on projects, on, on various projects. Um, the question I ask is, what do you think about building that community outside of the project? Like, What would you like to see happen in this industry to kind of continue to build those communities where they're not specifically tied to a project so you can have that information sharing that you're doing, but you're doing it project to project, which is, 
it's kind of siloed within your community and not the broader community. So I, I guess the question for any one, any one of you is, how would you like to see that community building happening? Well, yeah, you touched that one. Well, I think <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's, I'm only going to touch on it a little bit because it's like Ed and I need to have a panel with y'all about this one. But <laughs> I, I'd love to set that panel. Up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you know. I think the one thing that is um, this is not necessarily connected to image making, but I think it's connected to like the greater reaction to what seems to be an anti-community building model as a response to filmmaking, which I feel really intensely, is that people aren't investing in talent. People don't invest in talent. 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 Talent, Mr. Lockman. Talent. People are not invested, investing in talent. And what I mean by that is, there's already a formula, right? You and your friends in the community, y'all go out and make a film with the film, that, film camera that you borrowed from your friend, right? And you didn't ask nobody for no money, but you, you got your parents' credit, whatever. You know the process. You go make the film. And then it goes to Sundance. And then it wins an award. And then they put a crown on you. And then they say, that's my artist. But they ain't doing any of the hard work to get you there. They, own, they claim all you. They claim all your spirit, all your energy, all your community spirit around making it. But they ain't do the hard work, right? And it just happened that your project just like it slid through the door. Right, which means that your next project is going to be financed, maybe. Right, maybe, because that didn't happen with Ava. But maybe you'll get the crown, you get another crown, you go make another film. But how do we subvert that thing where you're not waiting for them to give you the crown, you just know that I'm an artist, I ain't got no money, all my money goes into my art, so when it's done, it's done. Now I need another bag so I can go make the next piece. Who's going to provide us with the bag? No strings attached. Don't have to go to Sundance. Don't have to be on the festival circuit. Don't have to have good box office numbers. Allow to fail. No return on the investment. Just that you are a visionary. I like what you're doing. Here goes a check. Go make something. Right? Because then what that does is, that's not just about the singular person, right? That's about the community that you came up with is now employed again. So now they can go feed their children. Or they can go start Harbor Picture Company. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, this is where we're still waiting on the cats who got the big bag to, like, give us the crown, set up that whole situation again, then that person gets propelled. And remember, when they get propelled out into that world, you're kind of not bringing your friends with you. They're going to tell you, these are our friends, you go work with them. Because I don't trust that you can maintain the expectation, which is, I need my money back, I need you to do what I tell you to do. You know what I mean? So I just think that for me, in terms of like the existential idea of community but it's beyond my own silo is like, there's so much talent. I live in Baltimore. It's like, it's crazy. It's crazy, the amount of talent. I can name like five, six cinematographers smashing it. I don't even want you, like, I'm just happy, all right, I just want to watch what y'all are doing and then I'm going to appropriate what you're doing and I'm going to go to the next film and do just exactly what you did because it was so interesting and it may inform my practice differently. Mm -hmm. But who's gonna give them the money? Who's gonna, give, who's gonna give Angel Williams the money to make the next film so that she can then go hire Kirby and then Kirby can hire, Baltimore got an unemployment issue. Baltimore, Kirby can then go hire every, his friends in Baltimore to be part of the crew. Like This is the thing that I think is the, about the greater community building. You know, Not just like, I got the award, I got the prize, I'm the winner now, it's about like, Who's working? You know what I'm saying? Can people, who's feeding their kids with this? This is, what this, this is the beautiful part about what we do is like, we're privileged to make mm -hmm. art and get them, be on set with our friends every day, but we also like able to take care of our families and our community. That's incredible. You know what I mean? And that, that for me is like the bigger, that investment. Like who's got it? Who's gonna be willing to make, sign the checks? Like the guy at Morehouse that wrote the $40 million check and excused everybody's student loans. Like, he didn't even blink. He knew he, it was part of his duty to do that. Where's that, where's that, where's that, feeling, where's that philanthropic thing in film? Mm -hmm. I know some cats that do it, but I'm just saying, like, we're, you know, like, we need that. That's what we need, you know? I think, uh, again, to Brad's point as well. <laughs> something, that I, something that I appreciate so much about you and, and, and our relationship is, like, you know, we came together on Pariah, right? And then... Ain't them body saints and and like um, 
you you stick with your your people like when it came to solo like I know you had to like fight to bring these people with you but to your point you're like it's 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 a it's a collective effort you know if you like if you like what Bradford you Young's work right, you gotta it's not just the one with the crown right it's you know everyone who helped you get there yeah. and I mean no one walks the walk like you and um, you know for every feature that Brad and I work on together he brings me three art installation projects and like we have just as much fun if not more fun collaborating on these things that are you know getting installed in like a church in Baltimore or in Philadelphia or something and like those are just as special and in many ways more rewarding uh, than when we're doing like these bigger commercial projects. Mm -hmm. And, and we shouldn't forget that we're all here at Camry Mosh. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, this exactly. is our community. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we 100%. come here with films or without. We come here to support each other. Yeah. Up here. So, should I wait for the mic? Or oh, it's okay. <laughs> speak up. Yeah. Um, I wanted you, I would love you, I, I would love for you to touch on the concept of references and originality and the danger of borrowing from films versus uh, paintings, as uh, Matt said, because there sometimes creeps the feeling that um, looks are becoming prevalent and um, that, that there are trends. And um, so I would love your take on that. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah, why, yes. re why don't you repeat it? <laughs> <Here, repeat. laughs> I mean, the question uh, uh, was was about uh, the, the the problem or the or the question of uh, uh, references and trends in uh, you know uh, when you go to a reference are you using it to, to, as a as a thing something to copy or or something to uh, to take inspiration from is that another way of saying the same okay I I would address that uh, Gadar says a very good thing he says. There's nothing wrong with stealing. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with it. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I work with Todd and we reference uh, other genres and cinemas and even filmmakers, but, but it's how you apply that. You know, I saw this brilliant film two years ago, uh, uh, The Elephant's Still Sitting. Mm. And if you look at that film, you could say, oh, that's a reference to a Bellatar or Miloshansko or you know because it's long extended shots but he did it in his own interpretation in his own story that's unique into itself so there's nothing really original but it's how you apply what you experience through other what's gone before I would also say um, a lot of times people will bring in a reference book and they'll have post-it notes and literally like like Matt said pointing out specific details uh, and that's all fine and good and, and, and can be very helpful but um, working with Harris Savitas Harris would bring in <coughs> stacks of books of mostly of paintings and he'd say we're not gonna talk we're just gonna go through these pages and we're not gonna point at any one specific thing it's just let's just calibrate our brains he actually took me to the Metropolitan Museum one time. We just looked at paintings, and like, just to calibrate. So it wasn't about copying. It was just more like, hey, I want this movie to feel more like an oil painting than you know. If we jump straight into like building the look uh, without kind of uh, uh, balancing our brain with with these with these paintings, um, it'd be kind of hard to kind of get to that look. That that was a magical experience um, doing that with her. It was a really great approach. To this day, I will sometimes pull out, I have a bunch of photography books and painting books at Harbor. If I've got some downtime, I just pull out the books and just kind of page through and just try to like absorb. More questions? that your brain and your eye goes through from when you start the project to when you finish it, you know, like delivering something. You know, you spend so many times like looking at the color and then how do you reset? How do you, do, 
do you guys have like specific things that you do? Or you just kind of like, you just like walk away for a second and just need to like reset for a moment so that we can stay on track on this. Well, the question is, uh, how, how do you reset? Uh, when you've been spending hours and hours looking at these images and uh, you need to reset your eye and reset your brain. A couple things really quick is definitely we'll take walks, you know, like just get out of the room. Um, and certainly if you're switching from P3 to now let's look at it on a monitor or certainly if it's HDR, like you, you better take a two times around the block. If you're switching to HDR, that's like a whole other headspace. Um, uh, and the, uh, the other thing is when, when we work together, like we don't spend too much time sitting on one particular shot or one particular scene. Like it's all about inspiration and reaction right then and there. If you know, Brad's like, hey, let's, let's cool this off. We're like, boom, 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 cool it off, moving on. Because we know we're going to see it again the next day as we come back around. Um, I feel like if you sit on one scene, for two hours and you're pushing different looks into it, you just, like, I, I lose it after the first 10 minutes. So, I, and I'll tell you, I'm like, let's just move on. Like, we played with this enough and, and we'll come back to it. And certainly the look evolves, you know, when we get through the end of the movie and we come back to the beginning, we're like, my God, what were we thinking, you know? And that happens like the first two reels and then the third reel, you're like, oh, okay, like this is, like we definitely come you know, the, the look evolves in the DI um, from day one to the end, uh, definitely. Well, I'd sort of say I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, I think they need the room for uh, uh, the next uh, event. But uh, please join me in thanking Harbor and our panelists.